Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday, June the 7th, and our morning coffee time. Oh. Setting up, I was trying to keep one eye on the chat here, and I see a few people are reading Ajahn Sona's new book, Bloom. So I have not read that, but I have faith that it's worth reading. <laughs> so, and it seems like a few of my friends here are recommending it and enjoying it. So that's good to hear. So speaking of Ajahn Sona, I had a clarification from him. He himself popped into the comment section of yesterday's morning coffee to clarify that the uh, the uh, series on the jhanas, a talk of six given in uh, March of this year, probably won't be ready till closer to the last Sunday of the month. So June 28th is the target date. So they are busy Dantika and Metta and Ajahn and team at Birkin are massaging them and polishing them before presenting them. So we look forward to that towards the end of the month. Uh, and then the plan is to watch those premieres on Sunday afternoon uh, as they come out. And then uh, people want to uh, revisit the themes and hear my commentary. Uh, we'll do that the, the following morning. So anyway, so that's a little bit of news there. Ajahn Sona's new book, Bloom, is out. People are enjoying it. And we have some new Ajahn Sona talks to uh, enjoy coming up in the near future here. So uh, yeah, let's see, 61 people. That means a few of our friends are otherwise engaged or sleeping in. So, yes, and today is a new day for our good friends Joseph and Kaliani. They have been serving as the Donna coordinators for um, the Sangha for the last six months. And, uh, Uh, I just want to has interrupted me here with a little bit of humor. Thanks for mentioning my book Bloom. When they turn it into the movie, I can play Ajahn Sona. <laughs> I don't know if I can play Ajahn Sona. Uh, I'll have to think about who can play Ajahn Sona. Uh, so, anyways, uh, I saw a reflection from Mike here, which prompted the memory. I spoke with Joseph and Kaliani yesterday. They came um, for their last morning as the D Donna coordinators for the Sangha. They've been serving in that role for the last six months and doing a very excellent, thorough job helping coordinate and navigate through uh, a time of great change. Um, uh, historic, really. Um, not just here in America, but even in Thailand, the monastery where I ordained and many of our monasteries had to stop alms round for first time I know of in, uh, in who knows how long. <laughs> so, and they did a, a wonderful job and um, are passing on the torch. For those of you who are on the emails that they send out, they sent out a really beautiful uh, goodbye and reflection yesterday that I enjoyed. So, and picking up the torch uh, and giving some service to uh, the monastics and the lay people, you all who are helping support us in this most essential way, is a couple named Susie and Casey who live here in White Salmon. And they're relatively new to White Salmon. I think they've been here for a year, or a little over a year. So, 
and I have great confidence that they will enjoy doing it and you will enjoy having them to consult and help uh, coordinate uh, the meal offerings for the monastics here at the uh, Pacific Hermitage. So uh, if you're not on that list, uh, you can visit pacifichermitage.org and there's a Either on the contact page or on the Meal Donna page, there should be something um, about the uh, email address for the Donna coordinators, Donna, D-A-N-A, -A, at pacifichermitage.org. So, and you can congratulate them on their offer to help out and get on the mailing list. We don't put all of the nitty-gritty details because things change so quickly with the uh, the, off, the uh, efforts to coordinate meal donna. Sometimes they change on the minute because of bad weather or car breakdowns or um, different emergencies that, that kind of come up. So uh, you might reach out to them if you're interested in helping out in any way. So a big anamodana though to Joseph and Kalyani for all the help that they have offered. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking a little bit about happiness this morning. Um, yesterday, I was listening to a fairly recent uh, episode of Sam Harris's podcast, Making Sense, and he's interviewing uh, Lori Santos, who's a psychologist and a researcher in, at uh, Yale and run something called the Happiness Lab, or has their own podcast on happiness. And uh, I find these research uh, projects into the theme of happiness quite interesting. And um, one of the things they were talking about early on in the conversation is just this word happy what does it mean to be happy? How, how does that word sit in our culture at, in, in this time? And uh, like many words, uh, maybe while not perfect, I think it's perfectly useful. Um, and, uh, you know, words don't sit in isolation. They need context, a lot of context, and sometimes even nonverbals and in, intonation and uh, there's time, there's place, there's character. So uh, they're imperfect uh, tools, you could say. But uh, happiness, what is happiness? And there's a little discussion in there of how pleasure doesn't really uh, strike at the deepest uh, definition of, of what we might think of as true happiness or the most profound experience of happiness. And I, I was thinking back even, it's hard to think back to my uh, original motivations, the temptation to, to remember certain features of our past and forget others uh, when we tell ourselves stories is so strong. Um, so like when I think about my early interests that led me to uh, becoming a monk eventually and spending uh, both my adult life focused on uh, Buddhist practice, my best memory of what it is that was driving that that uh, that movement in my life was not enlightenment, not so much the sense of enlightenment. I had very vague notions and very confused notions of what enlightenment was. I didn't really even think so much in the framework of dukkha, which is you know the chief frame of how the Buddha speaks about his teachings. And so, you know, to my best recollection, it's like, what was I trying to do there? And you know, as a young man, I was thinking a lot about in the scope of a human life, what is truly worth while on our deathbed, you might say, or 
in our advanced years, when we look back at all the things that we we did and gave our time to, uh, in the final analysis, what will we deem as having been truly worthwhile? And also, what's the what's the way to to live a life that maximizes happiness? And that that was that was what initially was a driving. Uh, driving me to start looking to philosophies and other world religions. Um, I knew that my own happiness was quite limited and ephemeral and fleeting and out of my control and had some sort of faith and sense that um, one could make choices in their life and uh, make efforts uh, to sort of enhance the capabilities or one's aptitude to living in a way that's truly good and happy. And uh, I did see the wisdom of the East, we might say, or eventually, you know, coming to Buddhism, Buddhism as being very um, full of potential as, as a means to explore those questions more deeply and in a way that wasn't just about a set of ideas. Um, I think even long before I found uh, Buddhist practice or Buddhist monasticism, well, not long, long, long for a young twenty-year-old, <laughs> um, the notion that one one needed to sort of find some way um, to go beyond mere uh, beliefs and ideas and cultivate something in oneself, some inner knowledge, some inner insight, some inner strength, um, various qualities of mind, if one wanted to be truly happy in a world that obviously seems so uncertain and beyond control. So so I think happiness is 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 quite an okay way to uh, talk about it, but we talk about maybe what it is that motivates many of us. Uh, and it's only later that I really started to understand this the skillfulness and the usefulness of framing the problem in terms of dukkha as the Buddha does um, most cent centrally sort of in the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. But we could easily just recast that as like what is obstructing true happiness and well-being. So, um, I remember... I remember several years ago uh, listening to an interview with a, a different happiness researcher, and he was he was pointing out uh, some research, some very clever research they did, where they were using cell phones and I think just text messages, because one of the difficult challenges in studying happiness is it relies so much on self-reporting, and self-reporting is not the most reliable scientific method. People are capable of so much self-delusion. Uh, and especially if you're trying to measure something like happiness, uh, it can be very affected by uh, so many different, <laughs> many different psychological and cognitive dynamics. Let's just leave it at that. But I remember they, they had designed some sort of study where um, they were recruiting people, and then they would just send them random text messages at certain times a day and ask them a very couple of very simple direct kind of questions. And part of what they were trying to do was to get to this the immediacy of what are you doing and and then some sort of metric that they used to quantify if they were happy. And one of the most interesting takeaways from their research was how much presence of mind sort of factored into happiness. Um, and you know, even in the midst of very mundane things or things that we wouldn't associate so strongly with happiness, like I remember he said, you, know, you could be stuck in the middle of your morning commute. But, you know, if you're really there uh, and and present when the reflection or the question comes up, um, what are you doing? 
I'm commuting. I'm in my car. I'm holding the steering wheel. Um, the chances are if they were uh, fully present for that experience, that they were experiencing something we might call happiness. And like, if they're not fully present, even if you're sitting on the beach, or as Legend Pasano said one time, um, one of his early insights before he became a monastic was when he was uh, traveling in India and he was in the north in a place that he considered just almost paradise, and yet he was miserable um, or subject to feelings of unhappiness. And that caught his attention. And he thought, you know, this is kind of strange. One could be in the midst of all kinds of beauty and blessings and yet still be miserable. So it's not completely about set setting, obviously. And um, anyways, just listening to them, them discuss that and the nature of happiness got me sort of thinking about the wandering mind and how just in a, in attention or a, a lack of presence and connection to your present moment experience is inherently unsatisfactory. And, uh, and I mean that in even a very subtle way. I mean, you can, you can really explore this in your day. Uh, there's varying degrees of how present we are for what it is that we're engaged in. And, you know, maybe just reflecting on the nature of the three characteristics of uh, anicca, dukkha, anatta. And as the Buddha talks about those in the Anatta Lakana Sutta, you know, things are unsatisfactory because of the anicca characteristic. Uh, and it's an inter interesting contemplation the mind that lacks a sense of stability, uh, a wholeness of attention, a sense of presence uh, to what it is that it's uh, witnessing or thinking about or engaged in is inherently unsatisfactory. Uh, even in, in very sort of subtle ways, you, you see this in your meditation. There's various degrees of samadhi or solidity or um, to use the, the language of the jhana factors, even vitaka vichara. So we've talked a lot about hindrances, but when the hindrances sub subside, what are the qualities of mind that come to fullness? And... Uh, the first two of the jhana factors, uh, vitaka vichara, um, they're connected with uh, a much more pleasant and, and happy uh, state of consciousness, and I think some of it is just because it's it's m it's moving away from um, the characteristic of of being buffeted just by the divided mind, the distracted mind. Uh, a certain lack of stability and presence. I mean, we know we, we long stability and security as human beings. Um, uh, if you had to get up in the morning and didn't know, really didn't know exactly what you were facing each and every day, uh, it's stressful. Like, in, there's times in Thailand, especially, uh, where I was doing the Dudhanga practice, wandering around and even though it's exactly what I wanted to do uh, on so many levels and there's a sense of adventure in it. Um, it's really clear, like just not knowing where you're going to sleep, not knowing if you'll eat or what you'll eat. Um, and even just the moving every night, like, and you don't have to. So sometimes, you know, you stay in a place for a period of time, but, just the moving every night, the inconstance, the lack of regularity, on some levels, stressful. Change is stressful. Uh, and then relating this back to the mind, it's an interesting contemplation, sort of the wandering mind is dukkha. 
or inattentiveness is unsatisfactory. And it's something to explore, not just in your meditation, but in your day. Uh, how much potential there is uh, in increasing sense of satisfaction and happiness just by enhancing the sense of presentness and stability of mind that we bring to whatever it is that we need to do. I have romantic, uh, romantic longings and remembrances for when I was a junior monk and most of the responsibilities or tasks I had were simple physical ones. Sweeping the monastery, uh, cleaning, uh, just attending to uh, the teacher. Uh, I found those so much easier just to, to be with than more abstract uh, administrative Kind of duties that you take on when you're a senior monk or in a leadership role in one of our communities. Um, but, uh, you know, how we live our life and uh, attend to our day has such a strong sort of impact on our meditation, you know, and so these, these qualities of mind that we are trying to overcome, uh, like, you know, you don't want to wait to overcome the hindrances until you sit down for your meditation in the evening, it's too late. If you've been allowing them to run around all day and feeding them, um, it's difficult to overcome them at the end of the day. So, you know, they need some sort of constant attention. We need to have a watchfulness over the mind. And in a corresponding positive sense, um, these jhana factors as well should not be uh, neglected. So uh, on some level, as it's appropriate, uh, you know, practicing sort of directing the mind, being very clear about what it is that we're engaged in, and then practicing in particular the vichara is said to be the sustaining quality of mind, like really staying with something. Um, and uh, I think thinking about it and reflecting about it in the, in this way is a little different than just this very what's now a very kind of popular injunction to, to be mindful. Um, you know, in some sense, vichara, vitaka vichara are, are going uh, beyond mindfulness, like as mature qualities of the mind. So. So anyways, just thinking about happiness today, um, reflecting on that. Uh, the meaning of that, and also in particular, sort of how the quality of mind we have relates to that, and in particular, the presence of mind, the ability to sort of be wholly with what it is that we're attending to or engaged in, uh, even in a moment of uh, repose or relaxing back from tasks. Uh, there's so much um, talk and consideration about this grand experiment we're involved in with our smartphones and the internet um, and how that's sabotaging these qualities of mind. Uh, people are losing their ability just to, just to relax back into a, a state of presence. There's always this temptation to turn to your phone, take care of a few more emails, check up on your social media feeds, if you're into that. Um, so this is a way of reflection today, raising that, and let's contemplate, is the wandering mind in and of, in and of itself dukkha? And how so? And in particular, like just sensitizing oneself to how that creates a dissonance in the mind or a dis satisfaction in the mind, even if it's in very sort of subtle ways and compare and contrast it with the ability to hold the mind um, on a skillful object, um, or even just on, well, a skillful object can be as simple as a neutral feeling, or as simple as the breath, and how much more happy and pleasant and satisfactory 
is that wholeness of mind and that sense of connection and presence that we find um, maybe first in our meditation and in a more full expression, but hopefully more and more sort of uh, through our day and the things that we uh, give ourselves to. So. I've blown up the chat on my screen, so I only can see a few people at a time. Uh, and These we call extra linguistic phenomena of communication. So Dill, I believe you're referring to my my early musings on the word happiness or happy. Love's another one, not necessarily a super precise word used in all kinds of ways. And there was one other thing that I really liked in that podcast in defining happiness, this phrase that, uh, Lori Santos, who was the researcher, said, like, by happiness, they, in her research, they mean happy in and happy with your life. So, you know, one might say feeling happy, sort of in the particulars of your life or in the experience of your life, but also that uh, maybe more durable component, like happy with your life happy with the people and the choices in your life, the things that you've uh, been engaged in, are creating, are doing, are offering in your life. So I like that, happy in and happy with. Okay, here's a clarification about Intonations and body language. Okay, so what was, I have to scroll back up here. Those are extra linguistic phenomena of communication. Great. Adil, are you studying linguistics? I think you are, yeah. The email you sent me or something about that. All right, well, I'll leave it at this today. Uh, I don't see any big questions, and we're coming up on 8.30 today. So see if you can manage to be happy in and happy with your life. Um, the happy with sometimes is finding skillful stories. Um, so, and then explore uh, the quality of attention and how that factors into the experience of, of happiness, contentment, and satisfaction. So, all right. Have a good day, friends. I'll see you tomorrow for morning coffee.